Fat Force Radio. Fat Force Radio is rated M for mature. Or should that be immature? Hey guys, Dustin Wint. Hey, this is Scott Snyder. This is Paul Dini. And you're listening to Bat Force Radio. And you're listening to Bat Force Radio. You're listening to Bat Force Radio. This is Kevin Conroy, the voice of Batman. And you're listening to Bat Force Radio, so stay tuned. Welcome back to Bat Force Radio, the Batman and DC podcast with no limits. Tonight we are joined by Bat Force Tom in California. Hey, hey. The Bat Force Times in New York. Hey, hey. Teases also in New York. Hey, hey. And I'm Robin Cross in Canada. And you may have seen us recently promoting on Instagram a Batman the Animated Series documentary from Stay Tuned that is currently on Kickstarter. And that is what we'll be focusing our attention on today. Uh, The documentary is slated to include many names from the series, like Diane Pershing, Lauren Lester, Andrea Romano, and even Marv Wolfman for the episodes that that he wrote. Uh, Joining us to talk about the campaign and the documentary's creation, returning to the show, Batman the Animated Series director and storyboard artist Kevin Altieri. And joining us for the first time, host of Stay Tuned and the creator of the documentary, Mr. Phil Mashi. Hey, hey. Thank you so much, guys. Welcome, welcome back. Good to talk to you again, Kevin, and uh, good to talk to you for the first time, Phil. Uh, how are both you guys doing? I'm doing all right. I'm uh, working at home in Los Angeles, <laughs> you know, like <laughs> everyone else. Same uh, here. Yeah, doing all right. <laughs> Same here, minus the Los Angeles part. <laughs> You're located uh, in Texas. I'm in I'm in Austin. I like to yeah. I like to specify the city because Austin is very different from the rest of the state. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. Yeah, and and Texas in general is huge, so I I'm sure yeah. there are some very different areas. It's incredibly different, and it's it has all of all of the different landscapes you could want: mountains and waters and deserts and you know, and highway fires and stuff like that. Highway fires and yeah, it's great. It's got all all your favorite flavors. <laughs> <laughs> and Just and like, then there are the areas where guys are making documentaries about Batman the Animated Series. Uh, that's just that's just a commonplace thing. And any part? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> any any normal day in the life of an Austin city person. Yes. So both of you are obviously involved with the documentary. Uh, how did all of this uh, get rolling? How did you come together on it? Probably. Well, Kevin, right? Kevin, you you were you were probably yeah. talking to the producer about it first. Yeah, uh, I, but I mean, it's uh, it's kind of like just everyone was like, and like I did a couple of interviews and stuff. I've done a few podcasts, like with you guys and stuff, and I did uh, a Scooby Doo one with Phil, mm-hmm. you know. And uh, actually, he's uh, rather impressive with his uh, abilities to do documentaries. He's done Thanks. quite a few, and uh, they're pretty entertaining so that's kind of like how he ended up uh he also has a talent for um being able to talk to people like you know when he when phil calls up uh, someone and like wants to interview him or wants to interview it seems like people that usually don't do interviews will do interviews with phil we're we're Um, recording this right (laughs) no no did you want us to start (laughs) yeah someone someone start one just want to make sure that we're getting this on on record. No, <laughs> thank you, thank you no, for saying that. <laughs> no, it's true, it's it's uh, true, and that's like that's that's been that's my involvement. You know, is just you know if 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 it wasn't Phil like doing the interviewing and stuff, I probably wouldn't be doing it. You know. So Kevin so. Was, was nice enough to be on on my uh, live stream show this summer, this past summer. Uh, stay tuned live, and so he was one of the guests on there, and. The producer of the documentary, well, he's he's producer now, but back then I didn't know him. He saw my interview with Kevin, 
And then he reached out to me because he was already connected with Kevin. And through that relationship, which kind of went uh, different ways over the over the months that followed, um, eventually led to the Scooby Doo thing that that Kevin just mentioned. And then after that was all over with, um, just there was some downtime, and and this same producer then came to me in I think late November and said, "Hey, how do you feel about doing a, a longer format interview type thing? Uh, but we want to make sure that it's about Kevin and it's about Batman." And I was like, "That's." a dream project. I'm not going to say no to that. So, yeah. And then the thing too, about this is, um, you're getting, you know, a lot of the people that generally don't get together and, uh, do the documentaries, you know, like Lauren, it's like, I really, and they're all really great people. I mean, I don't know everyone that's going to be involved, but, uh, so far, it just sounds like a, a good a good group of people that you generally don't hear from. That, like and that's, you're, oh, sorry, go ahead. You're, you're getting a Dan Reba, right? Dan Reba's in there, yeah. Yeah. It's like, you know, for instance, like, you know, Dan and I, I mean, it's like doing Batman. Dan and I were like, you know, a team in the room and with Brad Raider. And it's like, and it's like there's a lot of stories and there's a lot of things that went on that generally people don't hear about you know and uh so it's actually kind of a worthy project i think that's a big part of my motivation what kevin was just saying was talking with people who don't typically get a a lot of screen time for the work that they did and so that's been the focus behind my my podcast series stay tuned so the idea is to take that sensibility that is in the podcast and now bring that in a feature film format uh, about Batman in, in a way that I think the fans haven't really had a chance to be properly exposed to yet. Not, you know, not to, not to knock anybody who makes documentary stuff, but a lot of those pieces typically are uh, very safe. I'm going to say that as, as carefully as uh, I'm going to be safe saying that. So they're very <laughs> safe pieces, mm. you know? So a lot of folks think they know, everything that there is to know and what I've been so fortunate and appreciative over, over the last couple of years that I've done stay tuned is a, a lot of the conversations I'll have, I'll, I'll learn brand new stuff along the way. And I start to go, Oh gosh, there's like way more going on here than I think I ever realized. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes that's some of the, the best stuff that uh, you get to learn about. Cause you know, especially with something that has been kind of beloved for so long for so many people, it's hard to kind of um, find, you know, those little stories and um, and uh, facts about things. And sometimes those individuals who don't get the opportunity to speak about their experiences are the ones that have these like really just intricate and crazy stories that no one ever knew about. And I, I remember being at a convention one time and there was an artist who um, he worked on. I, I can't remember how many seasons, but all he did the entire time was he was just doing background art. Like he was just doing buildings and, and, you know, he was just, that's what he was doing the whole time. And I'm flipping through these pages of of his backgrounds and I'm like the detail in these backgrounds that he was doing and like the colors and, and he was just talking about, you know, his work on that stuff. And it's like, man, I could listen to this guy like all day, just talk about the backgrounds of this show because they were so like, these backgrounds were so awesome and how everything was, you know, painted over black instead of, instead of white and how that adds to it. So what are some like? Is there anything that you found out for the first time? I don't want to give anything away, but is there anything that you can hint about, like learning for the first time about doing this specific uh, topic for a documentary that just kind of open your eyes a little bit more? So I'm gonna keep my safe hat on the entire interview at this point. I know uh, I just realized I just can't uh, blow this. I will. I well for a number of reasons. <laughs> I will say. Um, so there was an interview I did on Batman related in, in the early episodes of Stay Tuned. And this was a guy who worked on Who Framed Roger Rabbit, uh, one of the animators. And one of the things that he said in that interview, I will never forget. And this is public. Anybody can listen to it. But it's, it's something that stayed in my brain ever since. And he said that the history of animation is written by those who survive it the longest or something along the lines of that. Mm. That when somebody, it's somebody thought it's true, right? So if somebody dies off and then somebody else is still alive, they start telling their own story like they're the ones that invented it. And 
So my, my, my point in saying that is some people are louder than others. Some people get to ha have their story heard more than others. And if you say something often enough, that's the thing that everybody will associate it with. And, and it doesn't mean that it was never true. But if I if I showed you a rainbow and said, check out this blue line, you would go, well, look at all the other lines in that. Like, no, no, it's blue. And you're like, yeah, there's a blue line there, but there's all these other colors there. That's what that's kind of what I'm getting at. Mm, yeah. No, and it's in working in animation. Uh, it's <laughs> there's a lot of stories. <laughs> and there's a lot that, and there's a lot that that happens in every single production. And uh, one thing that always hit me, like I didn't have the opportunity to go to places like Cal Arts or the uh, School of Visual Arts, and you know, or the um, Art Students League in New York or Art Center, or any, you know, any of the major schools. Um, it's like I I didn't have that opportunity. But the thing that got me through was like I had all these misconceptions because when I was in the, I was growing up in the 70s and I wanted to be an artist but I was you know I wanted to work in animation I wanted to work in special effects I wanted to you know be an illustrator I wanted to do comics and back then kind of what you got for information was like a puff piece um mm. definitely not the truth <laughs> You know, I remember I wanted to be an illustrator and it's like, and I idolized Frank Frazetta as we all did. Yes. Yeah. You know? And he's, he's a genius. And then I remember while I was trying to go to art school, uh, amid the American artist magazine came out with this article by Frank interviewing Frank Frazetta and showing his paintings. And it was like, they were giving him the Norman Rockwell treatment. And I'll never forgive, forgive Frank for this because in the article, he, they said, well, what's your method? And he goes, well, you know, I kind of not really much formal training. I get up in the morning, you know, and I uh, kind of like rough something out on the canvas, come up with an idea, you know, put it on the canvas. And I'll go out and play baseball for a few hours, come home, you know, and kind of finish the painting off. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, I'll never be that good. And of course, nobody's that good. And the truth I mean, is, it's Frank Frazetta painting in two easy steps. Yeah. <laughs> Start three painting, if you count the baseball. <laughs> yeah. And it's, it, it was like stuff like that was kind of like the, where the interviews went. And I don't know if American artists did that on purpose or not, <laughs> but it just, that always stuck with me. And it's like, so I was always trying to find the real stories and find the real information. And when I started working as a professional, um, I'm really grateful that there was, um, there was a lot of people who wouldn't say anything to you or tell you anything because they don't want to give the secrets away because they don't want competition. Um, and that's kind of like something that still goes on today. But there was many people who were really gracious to me and told me, just stories of what to expect, um, especially when you're working in Hollywood in like a live action film, like I was in the eighties, early eighties. And, uh, and then it's like when I started working with the Japanese directors at Deke in the eighties, they were really helpful, you know, and they really told me what to do and what was going on and who this guy is and look out for that guy, mm. you know? <laughs> so, <laughs> And it's just like, it's just good to hear. I just, I find that fans, um, and especially people who want to get into animation, find this really helpful. And it's like, you know, and even just like hearing from actors and their experiences is just wonderful stuff. And yeah, I literally have a Frazetta painting on my phone right now, by the way. <laughs> cool. Like, <laughs> it's one of the dinosaur Painting. Yeah, it's awesome. And by the way, I don't hold that against Frank Frazetta, you know, obviously. It's like, I don't think it was him. Uh, but, you know, yeah, yeah, and it's like when I first got into animation, I had the audacity to uh, call up Alex Toth because I was doing uh, real Ghostbusters. Um, and I really thought, you know, it didn't dawn on me because I was in my 20s, you know, I'm just a kid, but I was directing on this thing and I really wanted to do the best ghostbusters possible and alex toth was the best and um he's like first off it's like i remember him going like 
<laughs> hey, kid, how'd you get this number? And I told him that, well, Larry Hama, you know, in, at Marvel in New York actually shared the number with you. I hope that's okay. And then, of course, he was really gruff at first, but then he actually became very, very helpful and uh, was really gracious and actually turned me on to uh, Pat Boyette and some other artists that were available. And those guys were really great, you know. So it's like, just as you get older, it's good to be gracious with the information, you know? Yeah. It's, makes- in- it's interesting how um, it's just like you have to learn. Man, you guys have to learn the hard way with like so many. Uh, it's like there's no book on this stuff, you know, especially for that kind of work. And um, it's almost like you got to get kind of like stepped on for a while before someone like is able to kind of turn and like, hey, man, look, I see what you're going through. I went through the same thing. Here's here's some pointers. And yeah, uh, yeah. it's it's amazing that through all that stuff, like we get some really good. We get some great, you know, we get some great stuff that we geek out over. And um, yeah, it's just uh, it's what what do you think is um, go ahead. Sorry. I wasn't saying anything. <laughs> oh, I thought okay, I well, I'll, I'll, I'll jump on what I wanted to ask. Uh, so it's, it's, it's interesting that if you're taking a different angle on this, like for making this documentary, you're looking to, to start pulling some, some different threads and getting some information that, that we don't hear because we've all seen, <coughs> you know, more than we can count uh, interviews about Batman, the animated series where, Oh, they talked to Kevin Conroy and what they ask him about, Oh, working with Mark Hamill. And then they <laughs> talked to Mark Hamill and well, the, what they ask him about working with Kevin Conroy. And then the same thing for you know, Bruce Tim and Paul Dini ask them about, about working with each other. And well, yeah, I I've heard all of these interviews. Can somebody ask some other questions? And in the case of Mark Hamill, they use the same clip from the nineties for every, they just rehash <laughs> the same interview. I don't, I don't know why they're doing that. It maybe he's, busy and they can't get him but they just I don't, have you guys noticed that they keep pulling yeah. the same interview yeah he's he's busy luke skywalkering that's yeah. true i wonder if yeah yeah i mean I, that's not in any way a slight against mark hamill i'm just saying it's, it's curious that but they keep pulling from the same source material and i'm like okay you know yeah <laughs> no and then, and then there's people like uh well i remember i did one was a live podcast uh on batman the animated podcast and um, it was for Eternal Youth, and um, it was live in front of an audience at the uh, Long Beach Convention. Uh-huh. And um, I and Diane Pershing showed up, you know, and I think that was her first convention. Wow! Like wow. all the years, you know, that she was Poison Ivy, and all the time that you know she had no idea of how popular and how famous she was, mm. uh, you know, and, uh, things like that, you know, happen. it's like, you know, cause people are, they're actors and, uh, you know, people li- are living their lives and they're doing things and they don't really know how much people love them mm-hmm. and yeah. want to hear. Yeah. Especially when, you know, it just seems like there was just this combination that came together with the art, the, animation the music everything was just like lightning in a bottle all in one and uh i mean you can't forget that stuff you know you have you you just you love every aspect of it and that's why now it's still being dissected so much is because there's so many layers of it that so many like mondo has been doing the music now you know they're putting out the soundtrack to uh to um you know they're they're incorporating some of the artwork and and they're making amazing you know soundtracks and that's just like another layer of things that like the music for the show is also just as amazing and top tier mm-hmm. and um you know it's yeah. it's just yeah there's just so much that that we you know you there are so many things that that have been covered but like i said you know like you guys said there's still like that's the tip of the iceberg if you really want to sink your teeth into what's going on that we haven't really ventured into well, you'll be ha- happy to know, speaking of music, that there's going to be special emphasis put on the on the uh, soundtrack of the animated series in this. Awesome. Doc. Good. It's yeah. It's just. I mean, it's icing on the cake. It's just such good stuff, and it's. I mean. I think it's a whole other piece of cake, to be honest with you. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. <laughs> because think, well, think about it. You know, there's not a lot of aspects of entertainment where you can literally separate part of it out. And still have an appreciation for it, but music does that. Yeah, and 
the the soundtracks too like you know i i ordered one of these from mondo and it comes with eight eight records front and back with uh all the different um each record is its own soundtrack for an episode and i'm just sitting here thinking like my god like they just went all out like th- these are scores for one episode you know and it's a whole album and it's just amazing and yeah and uh, you 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 mentioned the music being uh, a separate piece of of cake, but uh, with how popular the series has been in this resurgence over the past five or so years, maybe where it's been at least as popular as it's ever been, there are all of those rumors tumbling around lately of a sequel series uh, being made for HBO Max. You know, you even have people like. Kevin Smith saying, yeah, I've heard from people who know that it sounds like something's being talked about. Anything uh, you guys happen to uh, have heard on that front? <laughs> Don't look at me. Man, that's why it's so hard, I think, is um, like, again, lightning in a bottle. You know, it's hard to capture that. And if, if yeah. you don't have all the ingredients that you got the first time, it's it's difficult to recapture that. Like for an example, I don't know if you guys played any of the games. Yeah, um, I, yeah. I I actually have the artwork that came in. They get, back when they were cool about giving stuff with your video games. Oh. Uh, back when they were giving you stuff with your video games. <laughs> um, I have this little mini Jim Lee poster from Rise of Sin Tzu, and I have it framed on my wall. So oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. That's, that was a GameCube game for all you. All you youngins, that's awesome. <laughs> they uh for the for the Arkham series, the first two, uh, Paul wrote I think uh, parts of of the storyline, and they had the voice actors. I think they had at least I don't know, correct me if I'm wrong, but they had at least Kevin and um and uh, Mark Hamill and a couple of the other oh, characters. And uh, Ar- Arlene did uh, Arkham okay. Asylum. She okay, did. yeah, yeah. And so the, you know you had a lot of this of the elements, so it made it great. But I want to say Arkham Knight, as fun as, as fun as it was to play, the storyline just was not there. And it just didn't capture that same feel that made the first two games great. Because the first two games just felt like playing the animated series come to life. That's what it felt like. And I haven't played the third one. So actually, you telling me that makes me feel slightly better that I haven't played it. <laughs> yeah. It, it, you know, it's a fun game, not going to lie to you. There's a heavy influence on the Batmobile. So if you like... You know, if you enjoy playing a, in a Batmobile, it's fun, but um, it's here's just, what, you know. Here's what I like about the Batmobile. I like that, and I, I'm i going to give credit to Kevin on this one, even though I haven't talked to them about this yet, and I'm sure he'll have fun things <laughs> to say about it. But there's this wonderful episode in the original series called The Mechanic. And oh! <laughs> one of my favorite parts of that, and of course Kevin directed that, uh, one of my favorite parts of that episode is this flashback scene, and it's only on screen for like two seconds, but there's this really cool 50s slash 60s looking Batmobile that they threw in there to show like his old ride before he went to the mechanic Earl. Yeah, and you'll notice that it's knocking. The engine's knocking when it shows up. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but that was, I mean, am I correct? Was that a 50s, 60s kind of reference? Oh, no, that was based on the um, possibly the 40s, but it's like the 40s, 50s Batmobile. Okay, that's awesome. That was on purpose. It was, I think, it was the uh, it was either Jerry Robinson or Dick Sprang's version of the Batman. Oh. But the reason I bring it up is because I'm I was sitting there watching it and I went, "This is on screen for two seconds," and someone had to sit there and take the design from the old comics and find a way to make it fit in the animated series, but it's only on yeah. screen for like a moment. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. How many <laughs> days? How many days of work did that take? That's what you I'm know? saying, and that's that's. <laughs> That conversation right there, if we like took that bite-sized part of our conversation, that's what inspires me to go and do these interviews, those yeah. kinds of things. Is there yeah. anything that you can think of, Kevin, that took you like – it took like a week to just get the damn thing right, and uh, it was it was something that maybe like a lot of people do not know how much work actually went into it? <laughs> well, that's a bottomless pit. <laughs> you know, I mean, there's just, there's a lot of instances of that where it's like where things go back and forth, you know. And then there are times when it, you just nail it so mm-hmm. fast that it actually surprises you. Mm-hmm. But there are there, uh, yeah. I'm just well, like for instance, uh, to take the mechanic, just that episode, just to take that one. That 
was a difficult storyboard to get everyone to do just because I was aware from the start after we got the script that ACOM, which was one of the weaker studios, um, you know, they just didn't have the chops that TMS had or, you know, or Don Yang would, you know, would send it out to a better studio. ACOM would just do the ACOM job. And I'd worked with them before on many shows, um, not just Batman, but it, like, it, you know, Deke in the 80s. So that was actually a difficult board to do because things, guys would draw things and I'd go, uh, we'll never get it. We'll never get this shot. So we had to restage um, to make things work towards what the, to make it look good and yet accommodate how bad the animation was going to be. Mm. <laughs> you know? And then, you know, so there, there was a lot of instances of that. It was actually when, when you're uh, thinking ahead and trying to solve the problems. Mm. Uh, you know, it, it's that, that, that's just part of directing a show and boarding. It's like you have to you have to deal with the tools that are at hand. And then there are instances where there's always like that extra artist that uh, thinks they're brilliant, you know, that gets hired. <laughs> I won't name names, but I ended up Come reboarding on. a lot of stuff. Oh, man. <laughs> like a lot of stuff would get reboarded. Uh, not the core team, not like Brad and Dan and, you know, and Mike Gogan and Mark Wallace is like, you know, you don't have to really rework their stuff. I'm not talking about those guys. But there was always that extra board artist that just wasn't going to last very long on the show and generally, you know, would have an attitude about when you would challenge them saying, you know what, uh, you know, Batman's face is looking kind of wonky here. <laughs> Harumph, harumph, I've been in this business for many years and you uh, can't talk to me that way. And it's like, yeah, well, I can and I'm gonna because <laughs> that man's face is so wonky looking. Yeah. You know? yeah. And that that's kind of like where a lot of the extra work would happen. Kev, yeah. I had a quick question. Um, How far in advance did you guys have to work in order to produce a season and lay out stories and work with these artists? Was it like a year, year and a half, or? Uh, I think it was more like six months. Wow, so um, it was pretty much crucial. Yeah, I mean, when once we started doing the show, it was, um, if I remember correctly, it's like you start the show development where you basically, you know, Bruce just had uh, some character designs. Um, we didn't have, you don't have turnarounds, you don't have all the backgrounds and all that stuff starts, you hit the ground running and you just start designing the show and doing the storyboards at the same time. And, uh, you know, and the on leather wings, the pilot episode, obviously more effort was put into that because everyone was like learning the ropes on that one. Mm -hmm. So, but it's a pilot. So there was more time spent on that than uh, you usually had on the other shows. Because then after after On Leather Wings, we're basically stuck with like a five-week schedule, you know, to get the whole show done and shipped. And then another few months for that to come back in animation. So it was like once the first season started, I don't know if this answers your question, but say On Leather Wings, when it went on the air, um, I was just starting the Two Face episode, I believe, which was like six or seven episodes in. Mm. So you're not ever really that far ahead, you know. So it's like you know, yes, it, it has to. The ball has to keep rolling, and the production has to keep rolling. You know, which is also why you got three. Uh, they we, on Batman, we had three teams, you know. It was me, Frank, and Boyd, you know, and uh, so each of us had our team and, you know, and we were producing shows so that they had a, would have enough shows to put on the air. But it wasn't like full 26 was done and then it went on the air. It wasn't like that. Was it also like a committee effort to kind of see, because I'm trying to compare it to like how a writer and would work with uh, their artists, but let's say you have like 15 or 20 episodes 
would you guys constantly shuffle orders of the episode and kind of try to decide how it would come out more fluently, like in in the season? Well, yeah. They're, I mean, they're, they're all kind of standalone, but they all kind of have no, a flow to them as well. No, no, it's like because you got Harvey Dent as the DA. Mm-hmm. Right. Oh, so, yeah. You don't want to you don't want to show Harley Quinnade before Harley's holiday or, or, no, or, or reverse that reverse that. But the point yeah. is, yeah, there's an there is an order to them. It's just yeah, for sure. But like, did you find yourself moving it sometimes, or you guys kind of just had it mapped out? Uh, but that was pretty much uh, Alan Burnett, you know, and Bruce and uh, Eric, you know. I mean, that was that was from and I believe Tom Ruger too, you know those guys i think it was they they had it kind of mapped out um so when it when it that first run everything had to be chronological right. you know and there really wasn't much that i think they would move things around in the broadcast like pov if i remember right because it came out pretty well was moved ahead of something else you know small things like that but essentially no, the first Catwoman, the Cat in the Claw, part one, had to come when it came. And then mm-hmm. the ones down the line where it's like Selena Kyle is now established, you know, and every time and every time they would show it, you don't want to mix those up and just throw episodes out there. It'd have to be in continuity. Right. Yeah. yeah. Which was you- really that was a really great thing about the show too. I loved I loved the especially when you would like show um, interiors of Arkham Asylum and you see which rogues are locked up yeah. or or which ones are out. And it's like, oh, yeah, you know, he got locked up on this episode. And he's still in there and he's still I love that. So it's that's another another layer that just made it amazing is very similar to the comics. Like you had something to hold on to that um, gave itself some continuity that uh, it just it just, you know, heads and shoulders above a lot of stuff that's going on in television. Yeah, and one of the things that I, speaking of continuity, one of the things that I really loved do, doing was uh, Harley's uh, Harley's evolution, you know, mm. where it's like she had been in some episodes and she was like, you know, the Joker's mall, whatever you want to call her, her his hench girl, henchwoman, and, uh, you know, and it's like he had that. But then starting with Harlequinade, you know, their relationship changed the dynamic of their relationship we shall say changed when the joker wanted to blow the city up mm-hmm. and and it was really clear that he didn't remember he had to pick up harley you know <laughs> <laughs> like, and then after that i think paul and bruce in the continuity they did mad love that really fantastic comic you yeah. know and then I believe that Harley's Holiday is a, pretty much a sequel to Mad Love, you know. Yeah. So it would that, have been great. Mad Love could have been in the continuity before, you know, the was it the fourth or fifth season where they actually did do Mad Love. Yeah. But yeah, anyway, yeah. But it was like, but uh, that's the continuity I always, you know, because it's like Harley's Holiday where she said where she's like. Gee, Batman, I don't think the Joker may be the guy for me after all. And then, <laughs> and then she's declared sane. Yeah. And, uh, you know, after after Mad Love, after, you know, the Joker really goes over the edge, you know, with her. Knocks her out the window. What, what I love to see is when stuff that you guys did on the show um, being held as uh, continuity in the comics or other other mediums, too. That's like that's always so cool to see, like. You know, because we were we were on the ground floor of those changes happening or um, at the time, I, I don't know, I'm pr- pretty sure you probably didn't realize that that was just going to be accepted as like standard for a lot of things. But it's so cool to see that, you know, like um, yeah. some of the storylines you guys did and some of the ways that it was so impactful for that show that it just made sense to keep it for. Uh, and a lot of the writers now, what's so cool is um, a lot of the a lot of the writers and the artists, they were fans growing up as kids at the time watching the show. And now they get to be the ones to tell the stories that they like. And it's almost unanimous that like so much of the animated series is ingrained in their DNA. So now we're getting these stories that are touching back to it and giving, you know, props to that. Um, a big one being 
um, Batman White Knight, you know, Sean Murphy has pretty much said that the animated series is like 50% of his Batman universe. So he's just a- adapting his version of that. And so it's kind of like if you if you watch the show, if you read any of those comics, this is kind of what happens, you know, in the future in my in my world afterwards. And that's just and like you mentioned Harley. And I think that's something that you guys started is expanding on characters and building on you know, they weren't just characters that kind of existed. They changed and they moved and they, they grew. And mm-hmm. uh, sometimes that gets forgotten, like in comics or, or anything else. Or, you know, like yeah. Harley had such a depth to her and it's easy to make her just the side chick or the gag and the silly one. But, you know, if you look at the way you guys, you know, did her, she she has a doctorate. <laughs> you know, she's smart. Yeah. She, she's also like, you know, very athletic and then there's things you can play off of and it's cool to see those yeah (laughs) yeah (laughs) she's got a golden voice yeah 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 no no it's in and the thing is it's like in in the uh, new harley show you know the animated one the rated r one (laughs) that that actually is like that really fits into the continuity yeah and like and it's like in that poison ivy completely fits into the continuity you know it's like but what i like about that show is like how you know poison ivy and uh and uh harley it's like clear that they've had a relationship for quite a long time you know Mm -hmm. and uh (laughs) it's it's just really fun yeah yeah it's something and there's there's a, a whole fandom of them being friends that that uh fans have kind of just accepted and and kind of fallen in love with that uh i think that touches on again started by you know i think really heavily started by you guys and uh giving us that so just you know just a wealth of of cool stuff that we're getting just constantly that uh was inspired by oh speaking of um the last time we talked to you you were working on your animated series figure collection that they were pumping out. <laughs> Have you yeah. added to that thing yet? I mean, it's there, there's so many that they were putting out at the time. Um, I, I, I purposefully just stick to the animated series. Right. Sure. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, even yeah. if you're sticking to that, they went crazy with it. So it's, it's, uh, if you if you want, you could still have an entire wall filled up with animated series figures. And oh yeah, yeah, it's, it's expanded. Um, it has. Yeah. Its, whenever they come out with a new one, I do uh, I do get it. Yeah. Uh, well, the only thing I haven't gotten is the bat plane. Uh, you know? Yeah, that's a beast. It's like, well, it's not that it's a beast. It's just that I just don't buy it. You know, I mean, if you <laughs> my episodes, right? We we spend all this time establishing this world that's kind of a retro world. Um, it was a little bit before uh, cell phones. There yeah. were cell phones, but it wasn't as ubiquitous as it is now. It's like people weren't walking around basically like Dick Tracy with a computer on their wrist, you know. Like like right now, everyone's got basically you know a, a GPS device in their pocket. Um. So that's kind of missing from the technologies and stuff yeah. of the time. But we set up this world with the propeller-driven aircraft. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, the Batmobile is very reminiscent of the uh, dragsters and stuff of the 60s and 70s. Even so much as to have, you know, <laughs> you know, jet exhaust. You know, really, would that work for a car? I don't think so. But, you know, but it's kind of a retro futuristic kind of look on everything even the computer the bat computer all that stuff and then here's the bat plane and it's like it doesn't have propellers it's not even a jet it's like i don't know what that thing it's a it's a ufo it's a flying saucer it 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 levitates it floats it's like oh god you know it is just it was just made things way too easy so i just didn't i just never i refused to use it so if you notice in my episodes like uh avatar the script had batman get into the bat plane and go and visit talia in gibraltar and i'm like well that isn't cool it's like so we put bruce wayne in a panama hat you know and 
dress him up. He gets on the gets on the China Clipper and flies over, you know. Yeah. And it's like it's just more fun. Right? I just did, I, and so even even in the toys, and I think it's a great toy. But I mean, the bat plane should have been like a GB racer or something like that, you know? Wouldn't that have been cool to have that that, that toy I'll buy? You know? <laughs> I've got the Batmobile, and I've got I've got Harley Quinn sitting in the Batmobile, you know? So it's the Harley Quinnade Batmobile toy. That's awesome. <laughs> but yeah, no, I just just the bat plane just is yeah, just I just can't buy it. <laughs> I, I can't it's, believe that you have to buy these things and that they uh, didn't just send them to you. Oh. <laughs> Why? <laughs> Don't open that can of worms. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. They, they, it's like as a company policy, they don't, uh, you know, they, don't, they, they just never have done that. You know, I, I think the only company that... Uh, I think they, you know, there was a couple of Christmas hands outs and stuff at Warner Brothers, but other than that, no, no. It's mm. like the cells, all the animation cells I had, I had to uh, buy myself and purchase mm. through other you sources. Have to, <laughs> you have to go do the uh, the tour of the DC yeah. office. You know that all, we've had a lot of the comic writers on who, when they've been into the office they get to do the tour of you know where they take them in the vault where where all of the dc collectible stuff is and they just take everything they want yeah what well yeah. The, what happened is so they you know they they create like let's say the figures they make the figures and they have them all set but they they produce like 10 um press or review copies you know because they want to make sure everything's looking yeah. good and so they, they, they produce, like, let's say, 10 of the Batmobiles, and uh, a couple of them will get sent out to, like, toy companies, review companies, um, and then they'll keep eight in this room, and so they'll just be in that room. And so, you know, they don't sell them. They, they just keep them there for that reason. And um, so sometimes, you know, they'll, they'll have somebody come and visit the office, and they'll be like, hey, you, you want to look at the room? And they'll come in the room, and it's just, like, stacks of press and review copies of figures and toys that – you know they're just stacked up and so yeah the people will help themselves to it like uh there are some really cool dark knight returns figures that were are very difficult to get now because they were um you know made to order and uh uh josh will is it josh williamson he went in there yeah. and he, he scored one and i was like dude where did you get that because yeah it was in the room they just had a, had one i'm like that's literally a 300 hundred dollar six inch figure now like and, on and eBay. he was telling tom <laughs> king to take the other one he took one he's like take this you want this you want this. <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah no, so you I've gotta never, you gotta i've never been in the room gotta sneak in there as you as you leave the room there's a knight that says you chose wisely <laughs> Yes. Well, my favorite part is that they didn't even have to carry the stuff out. He said that, so he puts aside everything that he wants. Yeah, I want this. I want this. You know, just supermarket sweeps the room. <laughs> yeah. You know, makes a pile of all the stuff that he wants, and and they just mail it to him to his house. Oh, so you're saying I have the wrong job? I, I'm saying that uh, maybe you just gotta get your turn. <laughs> gotta go get it. And, and, it's, and what is his room? Where is his room again? The DC, uh, yeah, the, the DC I, office. Know, I don't know if it's still there anymore after uh, all these cuts, know. but at the time it was uh, in Burbank across from the studios, um, right where they film Jay Leno and Ellen and stuff. But yeah, yeah, I went down there for a visit one time and um, I mean, it's, it's awesome. Like you walked into the offices and everybody has their cubicle absolutely completely decked out in whatever DC character is their favorite, you know, and they got every, collectible they could think of you know of that character you know all all covering their uh, their cubicle so it's like you know it's a cool environment to work in if if uh you walk in and you're making toys right and so you have your your you got toys at your desk at the ready all the time you know as an artist too that'd be super helpful for references i would assume if you got like a you know a figure version of the thing you're drawing so yeah well it's uh we didn't have that. <laughs> I know. It's like <laughs> how much fact, easier. Though, uh, Kenner, um, who did the original run of the toys uh, back in the uh, 90s, um, they actually based the toys on the show. Oh, and yeah. Men, that first the, that first bunch of toys, uh, like the Man Bat and all that, 
they came in and they worked right off of like Shane Poindexter's designs for the Batmobile and I think the Bat Cycle. Uh, so that even before, I think, yeah, no, I'm pretty sure it was even before the show was on the air. Kenner was involved in designing the toys. Oh man, that's awesome. Yeah. No. Wow. That, so Warner Brothers was really looking ahead. Yeah, and you know, um, just as cool as the actual toy is the box art that they use on those figures. And it's just amazing. Awesome. Cause you know, like a lot of, you know, they go crazy with the suits and it's like Batman ski bot suit or, you yeah. know, they got like wall crawler Batman and it kind of got hey, out. Don't, don't be hating on ski bot suit, Batman. <laughs> no, <laughs> the, the thing is, is what I've always wanted was like the, who, who drew these sample pieces that they use for box art? Because like, you know, it's Batman with this, like, insane suit and then he's got like a you know a hang glider and all this stuff and it's like as a kid all you want is to see that blown up and like in action you know and so um it that that would have been cool like i'm sure somewhere in some vault there are some batman animated series you know artwork that was used for these uh these boxes where it's like all these alternate different variations of stuff yeah. Next to the lesser known lounging around the cave Batman where all he's wearing is a cowl. <laughs> cowl and some tidy whities yeah, No, it's like all, every toy company, um, they have their departments. Like when I worked for uh, Hasbro on um, G.I. Joe, um, they had just they had never done an an they had done animation before with companies like Deke, so I had worked with Hasbro before. But when they set up the offices in Los Angeles for animation. Um, some of the offices that the uh, producers had and stuff, they pulled out this artwork, which was like actually presentation artwork, yeah. which was for the uh, shows, the, uh, the uh, what am I saying, the toys, a lot of the toys that I grew up with. And there was yeah, like yeah. some of those paintings of G.I. Joe. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And they were really really well done you know and it's every toy company has got like uh that division you know and there and it really doesn't necessarily relate to what the animation is being done yeah but on batman uh it certainly was you know yeah it tied in just like the comics you remember the batman adventure comics oh yeah what I, what I wanted to know was, where do you get those cool little ice cubes you saw in the commercials for the Mr. Freeze toys when he had all those little blocks of ice? And you're oh, like, man, why did they never include that with any set? <laughs> yeah. And you're like, here's yeah, the I, I want to build the wall and knock them all over. That's what I'm saying, right? So there's yeah. the car, here's Batman, here's Mr. Freeze. Where's all the stuff that's around them? Yeah. The, 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 whole, the whole Gotham diorama. Yeah. <laughs> It's like some of the greatest. Stuff. There's actually there's actually a guy who was buying up. He was buying all the collecting all the um, um, animated series figures, and he's he's an artist himself. And he just started uh, like uh, designing his own like dioramas and artwork based off of you guys' backgrounds from the show. And so now he's got this bookshelf that he's he's glued all these backgrounds to it. So it's just so cool looking. Like it just looks like he, the animated series has a backdrop for all his figures. Yeah, and, and he really made it like levels. So like at the top, there's like a, a sky background and the, the bat wing is hanging there. And then it goes down through like levels of the city. And then the bottom level is the bat cave level. Holy cow. Yeah. He went all out. It's well, yeah. dedication right there. He's born wealthy, I guess. <laughs> he's got a lot. Uh, of I, I I think he's just uh, talented too. He he was able yeah. to you know just make all that stuff. It's the alternate reality version of Bruce Wayne if he decided not to go into crime fighting and instead to make dioramas and, <laughs> and toys. <Yeah. laughs> well, the one the one toy that I was well, they're all great. I mean, whoever's doing the toys now for DC is you know DC collectibles is it's pretty, they're all pretty awesome. But the Bat King. Oh, yeah. Alfred in it is that is crazy. Are you yeah. kidding me? And I love that they they based that cave on the on leather wings bat cave. Because yeah. if you'll notice from episode to episode, director to director, like the uh, the bat cave kind of switches around. Like in in Mask of the Phantasm, I'm like, what the hell is is it with all the with that dragster? You would not have all these twisting, turning cliffs 
<laughs> you know, <laughs> if you'll notice in mine, it's basically there's a turntable because there's no room to turn around and a tunnel that goes to a drawbridge, you know. But yeah. none of those bat caves come equipped with the wonderful mechanical set of arms that uh, Heart of Steel had. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> What, what the hell was that? Where'd those come from? I, I, I went back and rewatched it, and I was like, huh, I'm pretty sure that doesn't exist in any other episode in the series. <laughs> One-time use. It, not, it was like, oh, it's like it's a heavy lifting device, you know? Right. <laughs> That's why animation is so great. Yeah. And, and no one ever called us on it, either. It's like, <laughs> it's like the Batcave just changes episode to episode, you know? And I, I, I don't even remember. I think actually, uh, I think Ted Blackman actually had kind of a map of the Batcave. Oh, man. You know, where things are supposed to be. And I I believe I was following it. But it's like, then you go to this episode, <laughs> yeah. it's like it's all twisty, turny, and it's like the cave, you know, and it's like it's got these big drop offs. You nobody know, else got the, <laughs> nobody else got the design memo. Yeah. Wayne, Wayne Manor isn't too far off sometimes, though, right? You get like, oh, we're over in this room now. Where's that room? Don't worry about it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Well, don't, it's just, it's probably just like the toy from Kenner where it's it's just like an accordion that opens and closes. So <laughs> it makes it easier to get to different things that way when it's Doctor, closed up. Doctor Who had some influence on the on the animated series. <laughs> maybe, maybe that's what they were uh, referencing in the, uh, in the 89 movie when he was in that room with Vicky Vale and he's I don't think I've ever been in this room before. Oh, right. Yeah. <laughs> and then yeah, all of so... a sudden there's the giant penny. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah, some things are constant in the Batcave. The penny is always there, the dinosaur. Yeah. Well, the penny wasn't always there. All of a sudden, I don't even know why we put it in. It was just, I, I can't remember exactly the episode. It might have been one of the racial ghoul ones. But all yeah. of a sudden, you know, <laughs> there's Alfred polishing the penny. You know, I, actually, there, I think it's I think it's a part two of uh, what I was just talking about of uh, the uh, Heart of Steel. I think it's oh, in, okay. <laughs> because Al- Alfred was polishing it and then he takes the water and like rings out in this bucket and you see Batman reflected in the water in the bucket. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, the, the three constants in every Batcave now are the giant penny, the mechanical T-Rex and the giant Joker card. Yeah. What? That's, that's also, in, Ventriloquist, in the Scarface Ventriloquist dummy, isn't he in, in the cave sometimes, too? Uh, yeah, yeah, he's there. Sometimes he's also in, like, evidence at uh, at the GCPD or something. Yeah. <laughs> ah, continuity. <laughs> <laughs> but, Phil, uh, you were a, you're a serious animated series head. What What is uh, some of your favorite stuff and moments from that series? Uh, that series really made me fall in love with Clayface, I would say. Yes, absolutely. I, he is long overdue for a, a movie, I feel, uh, especially with technology as, as good as it is now, as long as you, you yeah. know, as long as you don't cheap out on the, on the CG. But, yeah. um, he's, here's what they should do. They should do, uh, make him the villain, but they should do it with Claymation like they did in Return to Oz. Oh, Yeah. <laughs> Like the mountain, the mountain King. I don't know if you guys know that movie, but there's a, but that would be really cool if if they made it with clay and it didn't do yeah. CG. But yeah, he's so such clay, a great character. He is a great character. I I think that if I had to blanket statement, what I love about the animated series would be how they humanized the Rogues Gallery and how there were so many times where Bruce was legitimately like he'll say the the villain's name by their actual first name and he'll be like, Hey, I'm trying to help you out here. Oh yeah. And I love that those moments because I often feel like violence in these things is, is over glorified without justification. And I feel like when in the animated series, when you see him trying, he's like, Hey, I'm trying and they don't want to listen. And they're like, no, I'm going to keep acting out like this. Then you kind of think in your head, all right, well, he's being pushed to a point where he has to escalate. And I, I think that's, that's where the the action is more enjoyable because you're like, well, it wasn't going to get talked down. So we're going to have to now go up to the next level, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Clayface is a big one. One of my favorites for sure. I, I think another one that the animated series flushed out really well was Scarface and the Ventriloquist. Oh, same here. Yeah. Same here. I love that, that whole, 
that whole scene in the back came where, came where they're showing the two different brain waves and and explaining how like what the heck this is two separate personalities in one person yeah uh, that, it actually caused me to go and look up you know different mental disorders and i was like is that even possible <laughs> <laughs> The answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. Well, uh, I want to get back to the uh, documentary some. So sure. uh, the the major thing is that so it's on Kickstarter, obviously. There is still time and need for people to get over there and back the campaign and take advantage of some of the perks that are available for backers. Uh, tell people about why they should get over there and and help make sure that uh, that this documentary is happening and and be a part of it. Do I me or <laughs> yeah 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 t- t- tell us what uh, yeah. what what's in it for us? Well, it, honestly, I I I just feel like this is one of those projects where, um, like I said, it's not coming from a corporation. I I would love it if on the flip side of this, Warner Brothers sees the final film and then says, "Hey, thanks, we'll." we'll Maybe we'll buy buy that off of you, and we'll you know show it on HBO Max, or we'll include it as an extra on one of the direct-to-video things. Um, but the point of it is, is that it's coming from a place of extreme love and appreciation for the series, and I'm and not from a place of I have to check off a bunch of boxes. You know what I mean? So I think that's what, what that's what's in it for the fans is. Um, it's being made by a fan. So the, I feel like I, uh, I'm i going to do my best to answer and ask the questions that as an audience member growing up, I was asking, you know, when I was watching stuff on TV, the, the questions that I wanted to know, I'm trying to build that into it so that that way all the fans can kind of feel like, oh, cool, he's asking the things we always wondered, you know? Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, uh, as, as far <laughs> as uh, as far as the perks and things that are available, uh, what uh, what are the rewards that uh, that are still available uh, for well, the different levels on Kickstarter? So most most of it's still there. There's a, there were a couple one one time things that got snatched up really quickly. Um, and those are the like the one off where, where a drawing, a, you know, an original drawing is going to go to a person. But there's a couple of really, really cool perks that are up in the upper tier uh, that I'm excited about. I kind of hope somebody does them. And it's where Kevin and I are going to like watch the film with a lucky fan. Uh, <laughs> and and I, that should be a very interesting experience, I think. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, there's some, uh, there, there's so, a really, there's another cool one. Canvas print, digital yeah. sketch. T-shirt poster. Wow. Actually, Kevin's, Kevin's going to do some really awesome digital drawings of of uh, basically if you get into the tier where that happens. I, I'm not. I don't have it in front of me right now, but basically that tier. Uh, if you want a rogue, a certain rogues gallery member, if you want to like you know Killer Croc or something, then Kevin's offering to do a uh, a digital drawing. So you can like select which one you want. You can. Oh my. Okay. Well, the, that What's needs that? a heavy emphasis. It's not any different than going to a convention. You know, that's, that's what cool. Do. That's what I do when I go to a convention. Okay. So if you're if you're a brony and you really want him to draw Batman riding a, <laughs> yeah, My that's... Little Pony character, nope. no, that I will not do. <laughs> <laughs> but if you want him to draw the bat plane, I think this right. is our chance. Hey, if you want if you want the bat plane, I'll draw you my version of the bat. Oh, there you go. Awesome. That yeah. Would be awesome. Batman in a in a two engine fighter plane. But all, Kevin, only if in the background you show the other bat plane crash landing on the ground. <laughs> <laughs> no, it so, doesn't. It doesn't exist in our world. <laughs> is uh is there a limit for um some of these? Because I'm assuming you know, uh, Kevin is being gracious enough to uh, do these pieces. So is there like a limit to how many of the um, of these will be able to be sold? For that one, I don't think there's a limit, but the price point is higher. So that was the idea behind that was like we know that probably not, you know, yeah. 50 people are going to do it. So okay. it, it, it's like a built in limit, I guess, without saying there's a limit. Um, but the one where Kevin and I will watch the documentary with you as like a pre screening, uh, I think that's limited to three. And but I think that's that's pretty fair because I don't know that Kevin and I want to watch the same documentary three times in a row. <laughs> 
you know, I certainly don't. Yeah, see, there you go. We're, <laughs> we're secretly hoping hoping only one person does that. <laughs> gotcha. Yeah, I mean, these are some awesome perks. And uh, Thank you. the swag is looking pretty cool. If you go to kickstarter.com slash projects, um, stay tuned presents BTAS. This Actually, you can just search Batman. I think it'll pop right up. Like, Kickstarter was really, really awesome, and they chose this project as a – what used to be called their employee picks, and now it's called oh. Project We Love. Okay. So they they chose it as that. So I, I think if you just search Batman, it pops up immediately now. Or if you type, yeah. I think type in either "Stay Tuned" or my name, it pops right up. Um, and actually, some Batman of the stuff the animated series, and it popped up immediately. It was the yeah. first one. So. And <laughs> yes, and, and one of, one of the or a couple of the items in there say uh, Altieri Films, which I kind of want to take a moment to to point that out because Kevin is branching himself out a little bit more now and. Uh, I probably shouldn't say any more than that because I I will let Kevin tell you since he's right here. Mm. Yeah, well, I, I think we delved into a bit of that last time you were on, right? We yeah, we did. Uh, oh, just like okay. Just, uh, yeah, it's like there's <laughs> films in development and I'm attached to several properties uh, yeah. that are being developed as uh, feature films. Very so, awesome. Uh, you know, and hence... Hence Altieri Films, which uh, I didn't even lift a finger to form. <laughs> it's like it was, formed, it was formed for me so that yes. I can. You so were born. I, yeah. <laughs> so it's like, so we actually, you know, these, uh, we can actually head up the productions, um, you know, legally and all that. But, and but, it's but, like things are moving along fine. And it's a uh, very, well, it's like in this new world that we have, uh, the, at the pandemic world is actually, you know, so we have to kind of think differently and we have to do things differently than have been done in the past. Um, the advantage that I have is that I've been doing things that way for a long time. Um, since that man, it's like, I'm used to working remotely with artists and with, uh, composers and with, you know, so, for me, it's nothing really that new, but I think it's really new for most uh, production mm. companies. Um, I know that you uh, were doing some convention appearances, uh, obviously before all this happened. Mm -hmm. um, has has that been a big change for you? Obviously, yes, oh. it has. But it's like is, this is this is the first year. How old was I? This is the first year since I was. 20 oh my god there hasn't been a san diego comic convention mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. like uh san diego even though it has changed drastically from the really fun party that it used to be in the early 80s and the 70s in the 80s uh it used to just be a great party that was in like sleesville downtown <laughs> san diego you know just a great bar hopping party where like dc and marvel would have parties in all these different rooms you know in the hotels down there and then where it became like the big hollywood shebang that it is now um that's different and uh, this is also they you know there's conventions like the east coast comic con in new jersey which is always a great convention and it's kind of like where i you know that's i went to the the Kubert school that's right nearby. Mm -hmm. um, and that's actually not happening now because it's just too dangerous. Yeah. Um, and I don't know when it's all going to start up again. Right. Because, and, and LA comic con was another one. Yeah. Uh, that was always, that's a great, it was a great little con. It always happened on uh, Halloween, which is a great time to have a, a comic convention. That's not happening. It's just too dangerous, you know? And if yeah. you go to a convention, a comic convention, what am I going to do? Be sitting there with a mask on and wiping my hands every time someone hugs me, you know? It's like, you, you it's just not, it just takes all the fun out of it. Yeah. Put a Batman mask on and no one will know it's you. <laughs> yeah. You know, one thing about wearing masks, that I don't know if you guys have noticed, that, yeah, the whole thing about masks, you know? Uh, you can tell who everyone is. <laughs> You're not fooling anyone. So all that bandit stuff just doesn't so, work. Something about that chin. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. 
been helpful for me because I get to hide some of this ugly mug more than often than usual. So yeah, but yeah, yeah it's um well this I mean the I think the tiers the tier opportunities for this uh, Kickstarter um, are a good way of kind of going around that you know people aren't able to see you at the conventions and um, kind of support you or you know get a sketch or something like that. But this is a great opportunity to actually do that stuff is uh, doing it this way, and you're supporting a great cause with the project. Um, you're also getting some sweet swag and, some, you know, an opportunity to get an awesome digital sketch. So I'm really interested to see if anybody does something like super awesome or unique um, with their uh, requests, because there's so many, you know, if you're getting a custom one, man, the opportunities are endless with what you can request. Yeah, just so. watch it. Though. <laughs> the, op- the opportunities for Kevin to say no are also endless. <laughs> True. No bronies. No little My Little Pony. Yeah, or anything like that. <laughs> uh, is there any is there any characters that like uh, are either like too technically just like ugh I can't stand this one I'm not gonna draw it like anyone that are just automatic no's I hate them. Uh, nothing that I can really that really comes to mind. There's that, there's that. Uh, in, yeah in the in the pantheon of Batman characters they're all really fun. Yeah, and also yeah. the thing is is if you're doing commissions as an artist you know. The one thing that's cool about commissions is like you can kind of uh, vary the character design. Like you can do your version, yeah. You know, and, and so it's like it's actually drawings that it's like yes, I still enjoy drawing. You know, <laughs> I'm I'm so, uh, that that's part of the reason why I'm not wealthy. I suppose is because I actually I'm one of those artists that what is it Larry Hama I think said that us artists are the uh, are always at the mercy of the boss because we actually like our job. <laughs> so it's like I I actually do enjoy drawing and the, and it's like some of the convention sketches. Actually, there was one that was supposed to be a commission that I did of uh, Batman and Selena Kyle and Catwoman, and uh, it came out really well and I really enjoyed it and. Uh, the guy that I was going to give the commission to for like a mere hundred bucks, it came out a lot better than I, I couldn't help myself. I had to do like, I was actually rather pleased with the drawing and I was going to give the commission to this guy. And he's like, Oh geez, I don't know. I was kind of envisioning something else. And oh, my you know, God. Like, oh that's okay. <laughs> you know, cause it's like that, that hundred bucks you're going to give me ain't going to cut nothing. You know, so it's like, I'll gladly keep this and make it into a poster or something. Yeah. There you go. You know, so, like, you know, I actually do enjoy the drawing more than, you know, it's not not really, uh, you know, and, you know, sometimes you'll just bang them out in five minutes and they'll be great and everyone will be grateful and happy. And then other times, you know, you, you do a drawing that you're actually really impressed yourself with, you know, because yeah. there's no pressure on doing commissions. Yeah, that's the best part is when you guys go off on something and. You know, the the fan comes up and is like, "Oh my god, yeah, I know." Yeah, no, and it's, it's, it's and that's one of the things about going to being at a convention and uh, how appreciative some people really are. Um, I'll say this: uh, one thing that I, I kind of enjoy doing, and I did this at one convention, um, at the L.A. Comic Con. That was it. It was at the L.A. Comic Con. I was at my table. And I'm doing drawings, and I was doing a commission drawing, I think, of Batman. I think it was of Batman. And I noticed that there's a little kid watching me. Like his, his, his head came just barely up over the tabletop. And I could see that, you know, some kids will just, you know, be walking around and like, oh, look at that, and then they'll run away, you know. But this kid was actually really staring at me. And... uh and he was watching my draw, me drawing. And I said, "Hey, man, you know, you what do you what do you, you want to be an artist, don't you?" And the kid was uh, said, "Yeah, I, I really do. I really do want to be an artist." And he says, "You want to do cartoons and stuff?" Yeah. And I said, "Well, what's your favorite character?" And he says, "Oh, I love the Joker." And I could see his dad and his mom and an infant, and mom's carrying a little girl, and there's an infant in the uh, walker that her mom's his mom's got so i go and i 
And the, and dad was like, oh, I'm, you know, he's making gestures like, I'm sorry, I'm so. And they're like, no, no. I said, yeah, come on, come on over here. Come on over behind the table. You know, sit right behind me because like, that's where you have to be to watch someone draw if you want to learn. So I was sitting there and I did the Joker, you know, a rather quick one, but it was like I followed the formula and I said, yeah, this is how you do his hair. And this is, you know, you do the circle and you kind of find out where the eyes are. That's why I'm doing this and all that. And so I finished the Joker drawing. And then I go to the kid and I say, here you go. And I give him the drawing. And the kid starts reaching into his pocket for some money, you know, and I said, no, 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 no. It's like, that's, that's, that's yours. And he says, but what do I owe you? And he says, nothing. Just remember when you become a artist and someone wants to, you in just help someone else learn how to draw. That's all it costs. He said, gee, that's thanks. Awesome. Indeed. Awesome. And his, the mom just tears are rolling down her cheeks, you know, and she's like, thank you. Thank you. And it's like the dad came over to me and he just shook my hand and he said, uh, man, you're a mensch. And I'm like, what? He says, yeah, I, I spent every penny I got to get my kids and my wife inside this convention center just because my son is such a fan. Wow. And, it's, and he says, and I, and it's like, Stan Lee's charging 150 bucks for a signature. And it's like, you know, I can't even get a signature for my son. <laughs> I'm like, well, don't worry about it. Now you, go. you know, so that's kind of like, that's why you go to conventions. Yeah, that's awesome. And then the, the plot twist to that story is I was that boy. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, given, <laughs> given birth to the next generation. <laughs> you, you popped up quick. You had quite the growth spurt. Shh, don't yeah. don't think too much about it. <laughs> yeah. No, but that that that's that's actually the really cool thing, and and you make a lot of friends. Um, that yeah, actually, there's a lot of people that um, I'm still in contact with, and really great people that you meet at conventions, you know. And uh, it's like one of the few times that people that I met and that I knew. Um, well, he's no longer with us, but it's like guys like Denny O'Neill. Mm. Yeah. I would see him all the time at the conventions, you know, and he's, it was great to get together with him. Uh, there's a lot of professionals that that's the only time that you really see them is at a convention. And they're friends, you know. You may talk to them on the phone and stuff, but it's so great to be able to just get together with them in like a atmosphere that's mutually enjoyable for all of us it's it should you know it's, it's a, for us it's for artists and for writers and producers and stuff it's kind of it's kind of like a party you know except that by the end of sunday night then when then the smell in the air is a little too much for anybody to handle yeah but that's <laughs> the con crud the con crud creeps in and you're like you know i'm i'm good i'm good and you start seeing certain artists pack up like two o'clock on sunday where are they going <laughs> yeah no, it's like it's, <laughs> there unfortunately there is that but, uh, yeah yeah but anyway, good though but hopefully you know the world will get back on its feet again um We'll be back at conventions, and you know, the fandom can like thrive again. Here, here. I hope. I hope it's a, a pausing moment so everybody gets a moment to maybe rethink about what they want to do differently. Because just between you, me, and whoever's listening to this, I feel like nobody. The okay. The uh, <laughs> the, the whole like the whole comic in Comic Con has been forgotten, and it's it's yeah. kind of a a pain point for me personally. So I'm hoping that maybe this is a nice little time out for the world to rethink some things. And when they come back, they go, huh? Well, if it's a comic con, we probably should have comic books involved, I guess. Yes. Yeah. That, that, that is a big pain. I, if you want to, you, you want to get to where a certain creator is or, you know, a, a certain vendor has, has their booth at, at San Diego, but oh, no, can't go over there. You know, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. are doing a signing oh, over God. there. So yeah. if you even try to go over in the area of that line, security is going to tell you Me. you can't stop there. Or, or I'm trying to shop here. Or like when I was going to the Wizard Con 
in Chicago back in 2005, and uh, the cast of Three's Company was was at that show, and I was like, why are they here? I mean, oh, I love yeah. the show, but but why but why here? <laughs> yeah, I don't I don't know at what point WizardCon turned into TVCon, but that's that's weird. They they decided to go big on the celebrity appearances. Yeah. And, yeah, that that's. I, I remember, uh, there was a transition year. I want to say it was like oh seven or oh eight or something. Uh, that was the year when DC and Marvel, who used to have these gorgeous giant booths when you would first walk into the the front doors, they pulled out. And I yeah. remember when I, when I was there that year, I was like, "Well, if they're not here, then what's going to happen?" <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, one yeah. of my favorite things for a con is uh, fan expo happens. You know, you have fan expo over in. Uh, in Dallas as well. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, at the I, Toronto I, one here, the way they do it, so the the con has gotten so big over the years that uh, the the Toronto Convention Center is there are actually two separate buildings. There's a north building and a south building. And when the con first started happening there, it was you know it started off in just the small building, and then they got big enough that it moved to the bigger building, and it kept getting bigger. So now it's both buildings. But they do something logistically smart is they keep all of the celebrities doing, you know, all the autographs and the photo ops, that's all in one building and all the comic and everything else is in the other building. So it it keeps everything nicely separated. So you go to the building of what you're there for. Get out. That's important. Oh, well, I mean, they should go on. Get They should should treat it like milk at the grocery store. I I feel like, like the, if you, if you have William Shatner at a convention, Put him at the back, so you have to pass. You have to pass everybody else first. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And and he's got a longer way to go when he tries to leave early. Right. <laughs> Shatner. What a character. Literally. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you ask Kevin to draw William Shatner as Batman. I'm just kidding. Uh, he would. He would. Ref- he would never put a mask on his face. He. He. <laughs> Shatner, no, I am William Shatner. He would never do that. I, his money maker. Yeah, that's true. Uh, uh, that, man. Bruce and I both uh, wanted to use William Shatner as uh, Matt Hagen. Oh, oh, my gosh. oh man. <laughs> but you know, I mean, of course, you know, it's like you can't. Uh, that would have been awesome. So, so, so Shatner gets gets the call and he's like, "What is this role exactly?" And you go, "Well, he's a washed up actor." Who can't no, get the ham. <laughs> He's a ham actor. It would have been a different performance. That's true. You know? No, he's not. No, he's not washed up at all. No, but but yeah, you tell him he can't use his face anymore, and now he's got a now he's a clay monster. Yeah, but no one can do a no one can do clay face like Ron Perlman. You know, love I just, love his performance. Just, just the roars he makes, like yeah, it's like no one can do that. It's like I'm so I'm sorry. Mr. Shatner, but yeah, you wouldn't have been as good. He's just got that. He's <laughs> got would, that. It would have been funny though, because it's yeah. like his uh, his ham, his version of ham delivery, which even Shatner fesses up to, would have been like a whole different take on the character. He he could have been not. I mean, I'm not saying they shouldn't have had. Um, and now I'm drawing blank on uh, Adam West I, I, as um, Grey Ghost. I, that was perfect. But yeah. but maybe he could have been a, been a Grey Ghost kind of a character, you know? Could have been that, too. Oh, yeah, for sure. Kind I of meta. Kind of, yeah. I think one of the one of the coolest things that the series ever did was take disturbing moments and it, like, blended in just the right amount of just uneasiness, but it's still it's still somehow palatable as a cartoon. And what I'm referring to is Clayface with... His uh, daughter. <laughs> yeah, I didn't see that episode. <laughs> no, I know you didn't, but it's but it's creepy to watch him absorb somebody into him. You know what I mean? It's just a really disturbing concept. Yeah, I can feel your heartbeat slowing. Right? Brutal. That that's why that's why I love Clayface because he's like he's brutal. Yeah. Just everything about him is so awesome, especially the way you guys did it. I love the. Um, the the casing you know to keep his human form that was awesome and just everything about that about those two episodes ben, Kevin you did some awesome double episodes I don't think you were on the second one of that one right but the double episodes were yeah I did I did feet of clay part two yeah you know when it was also the first time that we had like a openly gay character in animation you know 
I mean, you know, Matt Hagen and his and his and Ted was it Teddy? You know, they're, it's clearly it's clearly they're in a relationship. You know, and of course, once he Matt Hagen in his desperation to regain himself, it becomes an abusive relationship. Yeah. You know, because he's he's really not a good guy. No. <laughs> He really isn't. It's like yeah. you can have sympathy for him, but it's like, but he's he's, he's really pretty mean, <laughs> you know. Especially when he's going out for revenge, it's like he's unforgiving. There's just no way. It was <laughs> one of the first times when um, an anim- animation character truly scared me, because that his his face as Clayface, that's a scary ass face, you know. It's a cool. just a his chin, and it's like evil like it's like an evil job of the hut or something it's like kind of a jack-o'-lantern face yeah just exactly no that was actually a that was actually a really really great design by bruce you know that that one was that one was like it's like you didn't have to mess with it too much yeah just until they did until they did later (laughs) yeah well (laughs) i messed with everything later but i wasn't there so Enough said. And uh, you guys recently announced uh, Marv Wolfman for uh, for the documentary, and he was the writer of uh, of both parts of Feet of Clay. Yep, we so announced very, that. Very cool uh, scene. And then just before this podcast started today, uh, if you go to the update section, you'll notice that Randy Rogel got announced as well. Great guy. Randy did uh, Two Face Part Two and um, R- Robin's Reckoning One and Two. Mm-hmm. And he also wrote all those songs for Animaniacs. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's, no, that's, I've seen Randy um, on stage do "Singing in the Rain." Wow. And he played the Donald O'Connor part, and yeah. he was equal to the task. It's that's like awesome. the guy was like, yeah, that that is one multi-talented guy. It's amazing. He's amazing, and just the the two face. The first script that he that I read by him and, and Alan Burnett was uh, Two Face, um, both part one and two. And my God, the writing is so good. It's like he, there's I once that happened, I was like, oh, thank you, thank you, Lord. You know. Did anybody make the, <laughs> make, the, make the meta joke that that Two Face had to have a two parter episode? Oh. <laughs> uh, I, <laughs> it wasn't the first two parter. <laughs> It was just kind of like they would do that. They did that when they were introducing a lot of the characters. Like, you know, Catwoman was a two-parter, you know. Yeah. That's so anyway. I had to ask. <laughs> uh, so, uh, I'm glad that you whoever's did. Got it open, what's the, um, the uh, deadline for the uh, Kickstarter? So the deadline is Valentine's Day, mid- midnight to Valentine's Day. So I know it says February 15th. It's really at the end of February 14th, like one minute after midnight is where I put that at marker. Um, and so that way we've got a nice little holiday we can all kind of point towards and be like, you know, when this holiday is, that's when the Kickstarter ends. There you go. Yeah. Got it. And uh, this is going to be a lonely... <laughs> A very lonely Valentine's Day this year, folks. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm oh. celebrating the fact that I'll be editing film and not doing anything else. <laughs> How it's, romantic. It's going to be great. I can't wait to sit in front of my computer and just stare at the screen. It'll be A glass good. of wine, some yeah. candles. <laughs> yeah. yeah. i got to be careful with the wine, though, because then the next morning I'll look at it and be like, what did I cut out exactly? This is uh, weird. Yeah. <laughs> well, anyway. <laughs> so, uh, that's the goal, and then the goal for the film to come out is is um, April seventeenth, which is International Bat Appreciation Day. Oh, cool! Oh, awesome. And what are the uh, planned release methods for for the documentary? I'm sure it'll be available digitally, but you know, nerds like to buy have our physical copies of things. Will there be a physical release? We're working on it. Um, I've had this question a lot recently, and. Look, I love physical media. That's I have a video library that I'm very pleased with. It's mostly animated. So 
I, I would love there to be a Blu-ray, and if I can make it happen, I will. We're just trying to look into the legalities of it right now because, mm-hmm. well, the reality is I don't own any of the content for the animated series. So oh, yeah. um, the interviews are one thing, but if, if I show clips from the show, you know, that's another thing. And um, not to mention the, the score. I'm The score is I'm using the score from the animated series. Mm. So. I've got like 15 hours worth of music, and I, I figured why why try to reinvent the wheel? Just let them let the masters play underneath it. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, that's why that's why uh, all the swag for the uh, Kickstarter is so cool, is because that's right there. You're, you know the physical aspects of the collectible uh, documentary style stuff. So yeah, it, it's it's interesting because people who who've seen stuff that I've that I've done with interviews, I'm typically in the thing that I'm like as the interviewer, I'm not going to be in this film at all. Like mm. you're not going to see me at all. So the, the intro video on the Kickstarter page, that is my one on screen appearance for this project. Um, okay. And then you'll, you'll notice a poster on the Kickstarter page. Uh, there's going to be a poster from Kevin at some point. Uh, there's cool. like, there's like temp art there right now, but there is another poster that's on there that I actually drew and again, that's probably the only drawing I will be contributing to this project. But nice. there it is. You get to see the one the one contribution. Awesome. Well, we should uh, let you guys get back to your lives here. But uh, where can uh, people find uh, find you online uh, for the other things that you do as well? Social media wise, I mean, just if you search my first and last name, just search Phil Maki. You'll you'll find me. I'm I'm everywhere. Uh, but you know, YouTube channel, there's a lot of stuff there. Um, PhilMaki.com. I've got my own comics that I do, and I I released a little animated short in December. You can you can find that on YouTube as well. And that's basically it. If you have a question, you can always reach me. Reach out to me. Cool, cool, and. Obviously, Kevin is uh, is over on Instagram, uh, and uh, is it, I think there's an Altieri Films website now, right, where we can watch uh, projects that are coming uh, coming through. Yeah, I don't know about that yet. You gotta wait. You gotta wait till projects actually happen, <laughs> <laughs> and animation comes back. But right now, yeah, it's just just I'm just on Instagram and Facebook, you know, just informal. <laughs> just look up me. You'll see what I'm doing, what I've posted lately. Nice. Oh, cool. But in the meantime, uh, if you haven't done so yet, get, get over to Kickstarter, check out the documentary, back it if uh, if you're able, and uh, help this thing uh, be what it can be. And th- thank you to everybody who is doing any level of support, whether it's just sharing the page, what you guys are doing, talking to us. Thank you guys for, for doing this. And seriously, we... We all appreciate it, um, and I really look forward to bringing something that you guys, the fans, will embrace. Yeah, thank you for, for doing the work to do it. Yeah, My pleasure, and thanks to Kevin and everybody else who made the show, because in reality, uh, that's that, this whole project is a big thank you to them. So, yeah, sure. um, you know, I it's one of those things where, uh, you know, not everybody has their name on a TV screen, right? So I, I'm well aware that I'm the I'm the odd man out in this project in that sense. But I I feel like uh, a very very close kindred spirit with this show because I remember running home from school and and you know four o'clock and and every day whether it was a repeat or not. Uh, so it, it's one of those things where um, if I can give a little bit of something back to the show that gave so much to me, then that's then I think I did my job. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks, Phil. Thank you, and thank thanks, both of you, for taking the time to chat with us about it. It was a pleasure. And uh, maybe once uh, people get to watch this, we'll uh, come back and talk about it again. Yeah. No, I think it's going to be really cool. It's going to be really interesting. And I think uh, there'll be, you know, things that fans will just want to know, you know. And there's people that you'll want to hear from that you haven't heard from before. Sure. Okay. All right. Thank you, guys. Everyone have a great night, and we will chat with you again soon. Thank you, guys. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks.